Hello there and welcome to this edition of Global Business Africa. It's always good to see you. We've got a comprehensive roundup of all the key business stories making the headlines in Africa and beyond. From Cairo, Lagos, Nairobi and Johannesburg, we've got you covered. Here's what's coming up. Betting big on Africa, Facebook moves in to tap the 100 million Africans who are on its social network in the continent. We'll be counting the economic cost of Ebola live from Addis Ababa. And later in the program, South African citrus exporters voluntarily suspend exports to the EU. And we start tonight in the digital realm, where Facebook says one out of every 10 Africans logs into their network every single month. And that essentially presents a new target audience for advertisers on the continent. Of those estimated 100 million people, 80% access the platform through their mobile phones. According to a study by Ericsson, a Swedish multinational provider of communications technology and services, at least seven out of every 10 African consumers get online through their phones, and that's compared with 6% who use desktop computers. Industry observers say Facebook is pouring more resources into Africa to understand how consumers here use the, net, the service, and it will likely open an office on the continent in 2015. Facebook is also customizing products to fit the needs of individual African countries, like targeting users based on their internet speeds. The Investment Corporation of Dubai, ICD, the main investment arm of the Emirate of Dubai, has agreed to buy a $300 million stake in the top Nigerian cement producer, Dangote Cement. Dangote's current market cap is about $23.7 billion, and that essentially means ICD is taking a position of about 1.3% in the company. Dangote Cement is the biggest listed firm on Nigeria's stock market, and it controls about two-thirds of the cement market in the country. It plans to expand production capacity from about 35 million tons a year to over 60 million by 2018, as it grows domestically and across 12 other African states. ICD controls Dubai's corporate crown jewels like the Emirates Airline and the property developer Amar, and it is increasingly turning its attention to global investments after helping support the Emirates through the aftermath of the 2008 real estate crash and a subsequent recession. Now, the flow of goods across many African frontiers, from Congolese copper crossing the border to Botswana to used cars being driven in Nigeria, is all seizing up on fears that traders could be carrying or may catch the killer virus. Now, the trade slowdown comes on top of a shrinkage in revenues from tourism and the suspension of commercial flights to several West African cities, as well as Nairobi, a continental hub. The IMF is projecting that some economies could see as much as a point shaved off their economic expansion this year by the crisis. Now, the latest to take a direct hit is South Africa. The country is yet to report a single case of Ebola, and it is thousands of kilometers from any of the hotspots. That, however, hasn't stopped tourists and business people from cancelling their planned visits due to misplaced fears of catching the disease. South Africa's Minister of Health said on Monday that tourist cancellations for South Africa were, due to fears of Ebola, rather, were, quote, grossly unfair, and travel between Ebola-hit countries and South Africa was strictly controlled. In South Africa, we don't have anybody yet, but because we are on the African continent, everybody suddenly believes there's a lot of Ebola there when there is none. So we did hear about these cancellations. We think they are very unfair, grossly unfair for that matter. So a lot still needs to be done because the World Organization uh, declared that it might take another nine months to contain the virus. So it's not yet time to, to relax. In fact, we must increase our involvement rather than decrease it. All right, then, let's make a quick run through equity markets at this particular hour. Some interesting data coming out of Kenya, Uchumi Supermarket. It's the only listed retailer did report its numbers, full year numbers of that today. It essentially closed unchanged with a volume weighted average price of 11 shillings and 90 cents. However, quick run through the headline numbers here. Sales are up marginally, up 0.62%. Uh, uh, profit before tax down, however, by about 7 percentage points. And that, of course, does raise a couple of interesting questions. Does this point to weaknesses in the Kenyan consumer market? Or is this more to do with Uchumi as a brand and its ability to pack people into its retail outlets? We'll be looking into that a little deeper later on on Global Business.
When you come back, South Africa citrus exporters voluntarily suspend exports to the EU. We'll tell you why. And Kenya's electricity consumers have been hit by a surge in Kenyan power prices. We'll be live in studio with ERC explaining why that happened. Africa is on the move. It's home to seven of the world's ten fastest growing economies. We help you make sense of the fast-changing African business landscape. We take you where the business is happening. Global Business, weekdays at this time on CCTV Africa. The rebasing of Nigeria's GDP has been a long time in coming. The information provides us much more scope to know what the, the structure of the economy is. Seven minutes into the hour, you're still watching Global Business Africa. Thank you for your time. Now, with over 2,000 people dead and 4,000 more infected, the Ebola outbreak is fairly high on the agenda of the African Union. Members of that particular body have been strategizing on how best to tackle this crisis. The continental body, of course, is based in the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa. CCTV's Girum Chala has been covering events over there. He's live from the Ethiopian capital right now. Um, Girum, the AU has called earlier today in a special summit on this for, quote, support and solidarity from fellow African countries and the international community, and of quote, in dealing with Ebola. Now, in terms of actual deliverables, however, what exactly is it as the AU asking for? Good evening, Rama. The, as you've said, the emergency summit I mean, meeting was held in the Ethiopian capital of Addis Ababa, the headquarters, and the African Union, Rama, does not really have a clear number or the amount of materials it needs uh, to tackle the spread of the Ebola virus in West Africa or to other parts of the continent. But individual countries are supporting what the African Union is calling the, the, the support within from the member states like for example south africa uganda the drc and and other countries including nigeria are supporting uh, answering the call from the african union but clearly they don't really have a number so far as we know indeed uh, tell us Giru, what input if any does the african union have to the ebola response plan that the world health organization has been developing Rama, the WHO first of all said 600 million US dollars to be put to tackle the Ebola virus in the coming six to nine months. Now, that being the case, the African Union should have a share. That is logic. However, as I was saying earlier, the continent does not really have a number or didn't decide on the portion that they should be covering from the estimates of the World Health Organization. So, so far, what we know is in kind and money, countries are really contributing for the efforts of the WHO and also the continental effort itself is being supported by member states. So we don't clearly know what the AU's portion is going to be, but support is really going to the WHO efforts on, uh, on the ground at the moment in West Africa, Rama. Indeed, the WHO has also argued that security personnel are urgently needed, not just to protect the treatment facilities and personnel, but also to enforce quarantines if necessary. In that regard, is the African Union willing to deploy troops to the affected countries, especially Guinea, Liberia and Sierra Leone? 
Rama, yes, the African Union is ready to send not only medics but also military personnel. The situation is fragile. As you've said, Sierra Leone, Guinea and, and Liberia just came out of uh, a, a war, a civil war, and they, they are in a fragile state how, you know, Ebola came and make, made things go from bad to worse. So the African Union already understood and according to uh, uh, their, their commissioner for social affairs, there will be a team which will be deployed to the Western Africa countries, those countries that we have mentioned on Wednesday, uh, the latest, uh, which includes medics, doctors, nurses, and laboratory technicians, and military personnel to that part of the world so that the health and security issues can be going hand in hand so that the ultimate goal of achieving, you know, the, the, containing the spread of the virus as well as, you know, keeping peace and security in that part of the world, uh, Africa, can be achieved. So, yes, the AU is prepared to send uh, military for security reasons in West Africa. Indeed. Girum Chala, live there from the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa. We'll have to leave you there for the time being, but thank you very much for that. On to South Africa now. Citrus producers in the country, it's the third biggest producer of citrus fruits, will be voluntarily suspending exports to the European Union as part of efforts to comply with EU standards against a fungal disease that infects the skin of some of their fruit. The Citrus Growers Association of South Africa said sales to the block will be down 15% this year because of its action against the citrus black spot disease. It also says that even though the spots on the peel of some fruits are only a cosmetic problem, CBS doesn't really affect human beings, it would not insist on exports so as to continue accessing its key market next year. Angelo Coppola has the details in What's Hot tonight. It's an unprecedented move by the citrus growers here, and it's seen as a preemptive strike to stop the EU from banning the country's 2015 crop before it even begins to grow on the trees. The industry, in light of the current uh, four interceptions towards uh, black spot, um, suspend packing and inspection for the EU market on Monday the 8th of September. South African scientists say CBS, a summer rainfall fungus found around the world, can't be transported by a harvested fruit. But the EU regulations are very clear on not allowing citrus fruit carrying CBS symptoms into their zone. And although we see this as arbitrary and unscientific, we are playing in that market and within their rules. And for us it's important to show that we are serious about um, uh, about containing um, those, those issues on their behalf and uh, show that we are you know, a fair and model trading partner and we're trying to comply with the internal rules. According to the CGA, just 0.1% of all exported citrus into the EU has shown some symptoms of CBS, something that South African experts say is a negligible amount. Whether the EU is going to accept South Africa's attempt at trying to manage itself and the CBS issue remains to be seen. In the meantime, Half of the crop in citrus is sitting in South Africa looking for a market to go to. I'm Angelo Coppola for CCTV. And Angelo Coppola joins us now live from Johannesburg, South Africa, as does Jack Barton. He's live in Brussels for us tonight. Gentlemen, thank you. Jack, let's start with you. The EU envoy of the Citrus Growers Association in South Africa has questioned the evidence backing the EU's finding of four shipments with citrus black spot. Has there been any response from the EU on this? We haven't had a response from the EU on this latest development, but we have had statements recently from the EU saying that they do believe that this, this is still an issue and that citrus black spot or CBS can be transmitted. But there's a lot of criticism here in Europe, uh, not just coming from the uh, Brussels, but also from national governments like Britain. They say yes. You know, perhaps it is transmittable, but only in temperate zones, only in the same sort of areas where these fruit would grow. And the fruit from South Africa, uh, which accounts for about a third of all of Europe's imports, are going into juice in countries like Britain, Germany and France, all northerly com uh, countries where this is thought to be not an issue. And above and beyond that, of course, they're going straight to factories where they're being turned into juice. So it's in a controlled environment and governments, particularly the British government, have been saying so this is clearly not an issue and this shouldn't apply to South Africa uh, but this is an EU restriction this is not something of course that the national governments have a say over all 28 have to disagree or uh, or agree and this takes a lot of time and a long process and the EU is still sticking by this restriction indeed Angelo with this suspension in place now what happens next can formerly EU bound fruit head for other markets around the world 
Well, Raman, at the moment, there are lots of floating consignments on their way to the EU. Those are still going to be checked and they're going to be monitored. And if there's any black spot or symptoms of black spot found there, they're going to be added to the tally. They're going to be tagged, in other words. But um, for, for fruit that's in South Africa at the packing houses or in the holding warehouses in the country, they're going to be looking for markets to go and sell that um, citrus too. And the CGA tells me that this is where they're going to be focusing for, for the short term now. Coincidentally, President Zuma was in Russia recently, and it's quite possible that Russia would be interested in South African citrus fruit as their borders are closed to European fruit at the moment. Whether the farmers will be able to get into that market and get the same prices as they did in Europe remains to be seen, though. Raman, back to you. Indeed. Jack, the Citrus Growers Association also argues that there's been no agreement with the EU on the risk of CBS being transmitted to orchards in the European Union from South African exports. So why has there been no progress on this matter for the last couple of years? Well, I mentioned the countries that are opposed to this ban, Britain in particular, but also Germany. But of course, there are countries in the EU, citrus growing uh, countries who would like to see these imports brought to an end, countries like Spain and Cyprus, which have been lobbying to have more access into the markets, or their fruit is, of course, a little bit more costly, but they'd like to sell more of it in the EU. Now, that was an issue before, but as we've just heard, uh, you know, with South Africa now looking at Russia because of their ban, well, that ban has had a crippling effect on citrus growers in Spain and Cyprus. Uh, Spain is estimated to lose in the equivalent of about half a billion US dollars this year. And Cyprus, a big citrus fruit juice, uh, well, it exports fruit that goes into fruit juice, exporter, also going to be really devastated by this Russia ban. So, you know, before they were complaining that their markets were being eroded by imports from South Africa, now they're saying, well, you know, we need that space. We need to sell more fruit in uh, Europe. So there is no doubt at all, you know, the EU hasn't come out. We haven't heard official statements statements from Brussels, but this issue now where uh, the citrus growers in Europe have had at least half of their market, if not some countries more cut off, mm -hmm. uh, they're going to be trying to buy more time. They're going to be trying to sell more fruit in the EU itself. Indeed. Finally, Angelo, as a percentage of South Africa's total citrus growing area, how much have been affected by the suspension of exports from CBS affected parts of South Africa? Well, the black spot fungus is found in summer rainfall uh, citrus growing areas in South Africa and around the world for that matter. And probably between a half and two third of the uh, orchard area is in the summer rainfall areas. The Western Cape and the Northern Cape are excluded from this voluntary ban because they have winter rainfall areas and there's no CBS there. And this is something that South African... South Africans point to as proof that CBS doesn't spread via harvested fruit. But despite that, farmers have shipped around half of their projected harvest into the EU. And these farmers um, will stand to lose around 100 million US dollars if the suspension continues as it is right now. And then, of course, there are concerns about what's going to be happening next season if another consignment is tested positive for CBS. Raman, it could have devastating effects on the local market and industry. Yes, indeed. It certainly would, Angelo. $100 million in revenue, 60,000-plus jobs on the line. Thank you for your input tonight, gentlemen. Angelo Kuppel in Johannesburg, South Africa, and Jack Barton live in Brussels. Let's take it to East Africa now. Retail power prices here soared by 30% or more on average in Kenya in July 2014 compared to the same month the year before. Now, in November 2013, the Energy Regulatory Commission had forecast that prices would decline by about 8%, give or take, for the over 1.3 million households who use less than 50 kilowatt hours a month and rise by about 7% for the over 675,000 or so others that consume over 1,500 kilowatt hours a month. Data from the National Bureau of Statistics in July, however, indicated that most of those 1.3 million households are actually paying 33.6% more for their electricity in July compared to December last year. Now, Kenya, of course, has a fairly ambitious plan to add anywhere between 2,800 and 5,800 megawatts of generation capacity between 2014 and 2018 at a cost of between 7.8 and 15 billion US dollars. At least two thirds of that new capacity will come for new geothermal and coal power plants as well. Now, power price is usually a very touchy subject in Kenya, and more often than not, not very well understood. So let's get some hard details here from Kenya's, uh, on Kenya's rather, electricity subsector. Let's talk to John Mutua. He's the Acting Director of Economic Regulation at the Energy Regulatory Commission. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you so much, Rama. Um, let's start with the long-delayed um, 
introduction of some of these power plants that were supposed to come in between December last year to date and of course the power revisions that you made. What informed the assumptions that went into the pricing of electricity in the last tariff review? Thank you, Rama. Um, as you'll know, uh, last year in December 1st, we, we began uh, the implementation of new electricity tariffs, the retail tariffs. The previous tariffs were approved in 2008. That is, that is when the, the, the other tariff control period, uh, which was ending 2011-2012. So in, in, in the first, in 19th, actually, to, to be specific, 19th of, uh, of November, we, we implemented, uh, we began, uh, we announced the new tariffs, which became effective. Uh, first of December, uh, 2013, and as as you rightly say, we had we 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 we, we promised consumers that uh, uh, the tariffs were going to come down, mm -hmm. and uh, the delays uh, which you, you are talking about, we we had uh, some geothermal power plants. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we have, we have 280 megawatts. Yeah. Uh, Let, let's just get that clear for our viewers. There was about 280 megawatts that was supposed to come online yeah. in geothermal power. Yes, before June and 2014. Before June. And how much of this actually did come online before June? As we talk right now, we have, uh, Kenjen has already commissioned 140 megawatts, mm -hmm. which is now the consumers are benefiting mm -hmm. at a very low cost of 7 US cents mm -hmm. per kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. And this is actually providing a relief for, uh, for, for the fuel cost because uh, from this month going forward, we are going to see the power bills coming down by mm -hmm. maybe 10 percent, 8 percent. Right. Let's, for a lot of people who've been looking at the power bills across Kenya, their argument is, my power bills tripled or my power bill went up by a crazy amount of money. If you were to explain to them what happened, how would you explain it to them? What exactly happened? Why did power prices go up by 30 percent plus all the way up to July? Thank you. Um, when we announced the new tariffs, uh, we had forecasted the, that the fuel cost charge was going to, on average, was going to be about 5.19 5, 5 mm -hmm. Kenya shillings per kilowatt hour. Uh, of course, there were going to be variations, but that was to be the average up to June mm -hmm. 2014. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened is that uh, uh, around March, we were expecting the wrong rains, uh, normally which begin uh, March to June. but. Uh, I mean, I mean, even from the weathermen, uh, you know, the, the rains indeed failed. And uh, that's the time we realized that uh, we needed to do something because, again, we have to conserve the water. Mm -hmm. Because the water is electricity, like the water in the dams, because about 40, about 50 percent of our power is from hydro. Mm -hmm. So the way we manage the water levels in the dams is very critical mm -hmm. to manage, managing uh, the fuel cost in the long term. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we did was uh, b uh, around May, that is May uh, this year, we went to the, to the, to the press and um, uh, made it aware to consumers that uh, we were going to increase the fuel cost charge to 7.22 uh, uh, Kenya shillings per kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. The reason being uh, we wanted to, 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 if, to, to actually, uh, if, uh, because of the delayed uh, rains, uh, we, had, we had to run, uh, we had to run the, the, the other alternative power, mm -hmm. that is uh, uh, thermal power plants. Yeah. So we had to increase the, uh, that time to increase the power, uh, the fuel cost by 7.22 cents to cover for that. All right. Unfortunately, yeah. we'll have to leave it there for the time being. But I thank you for your time this evening, sir. Okay. Uh, it's been uh, John Motoa. He's the acting director of economic regulation at the ERC, Kenya's Energy Regulatory Commission, with us here live in studio. Now, speaking of commodity prices, let's make a quick run through that lot. Not much of a development across the board. Crude oil, however, fairly interesting developments here. Um, off the back of weaker data from the U.S. and China. Brent crude has dropped below $100 a barrel for the first time in quite a few months. Very interesting times we certainly live in. We'll keep tabs on that and plenty more right here for you on Global Business Africa. Let's take it to Zimbabwe. At its peak, that country's motor vehicle assembly industry produced about 20,000 vehicles a year. That's roughly half of the market's demand and it employed some 10,000 people directly and lots more indirectly. That, however, was a decade and a half ago. Today, the market has been flooded, as has been the case elsewhere across sub-Saharan Africa, by second-hand imports, mainly from Japan and the UK. And local assemblers now being pushed to the brink of extinction. From Harare, here's Farai Mokutuya. In the heydays, one in every three cars on Zimbabwe's roads was locally assembled. 
I'm in downtown Harare at one of the parking lots to put that theory to the test and find out what the numbers are today. Well, there are probably about 120 vehicles parked here. And out of those, I managed to count just four that are locally assembled. It's a reflection of the hard times. Willowvale Mazda Motor Industries is one of the biggest casualties. This factory once housed more than 850 employees and churned out 40 vehicles a month. But today, the machines have fallen silent. The company blames government policy, which lowered duties on both new and second-hand imports, rendering local players uncompetitive. They have been overrun by used car dealers that have mushroomed everywhere. The economic hardships have forced many to opt for cheaper used cars, which cost as little as $2,000, a fraction of the cost of the cheapest locally assembled entry-level vehicle at $11,000. A local dealer I spoke to says customers are after more flexible terms and trading options. A farmer, somebody from Toko, they would, you'd come, you want to buy a car, you want a car maybe for, 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 for 4000 And uh, you come here, you say, no, I'm, I've got $1,500, but I've got uh, kettles there at, 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 at my home. And then we can uh, value those kettles, and then we know we we'll take to the uh, people from who have got some butcheries and uh, who run the cars with the cows. They will we'll just evaluate, then we'll take the, we'll complete the transaction. Willowville wants government to come to the rescue by banning imports, as was done in neighboring South Africa. We have to do the same, otherwise we, we you know, we might, might as well forget about this, uh, uh, the, the motor industry here in Zimbabwe. We just become shopkeepers. They have found an ally in a pressure group that is agitating for local procurement, starting with government. There is a bit of traction on the government side. Like you know that the government had to, after, after we made quite a bit of noise about the decision to buy uh, parliamentarians, uh, Ford uh, Rangers from South Africa, a uh, government realized its own responsibilities and now they then issued a directive to all parastatals and government departments that they must procure locally assembled vehicles. A ban on imported vehicles could have some unintended consequences. Government revenue is likely to take a hit from a loss of duties charged on more than 60,000 grey imports per year. But it's a bitter pill worth swallowing. There's no gain without pain. No. Right? Mm -hmm. We're going to have to endure some, some pain if we want to see um, uh, something good happening in our country. Farai Mwakutuya, CCTV, Harare, Zimbabwe. Just before we tell you what we have in the oven for you tomorrow, quick run through the currencies here for you. The South African Rand is our main area of focus. It weakened in trading on Monday and it might get hammered again tomorrow. That entirely depends on the sort of data we get from the South African Reserve Bank on second quarter current account deficit data. If it's more than expected, expect the figures you're seeing on your screen right now to head south. Now then, tomorrow's edition of Global Business will be looking at 100 days of one General Abdel Fattah el-Sisi. He's a new president of Egypt. We'll be taking stock of his term so far from an economic and a business perspective. And we'll also be telling you how Ghana is looking to achieve fiscal balance and what you should expect from talks between it and the IMF. All that and more is lined up for you tomorrow. But for right now, thank you so much for watching. Send your feedback on the program to Global Business Africa at cctv.com, wherever you are online. Presumably one of the 100 plus million Africans on Facebook. Send your feedback right over there. That's it for this edition of the program. Thank you for watching. See you in 23 hours.